The Beast and the Bethany by Jack Meggett Phillips, Chapter 11, The Comic and the Cushion. Ebenezer and Bethany returned to the house two hours later, each carrying a sack on their back. Bethany's sack contained comics about unruly children, pranksters and mischievous goblins who enjoyed ruining princesses' parties, whilst Ebenezer's was filled to the brim with ones about superheroes and cowboys. They dragged their sacks into the front room and began to read. Neither of them talked because they had done quite enough of that already. Occasionally one of them would chortle or gasp at what they were reading and the other one would say shh. As Ebenezer read he felt his eyes begin to tire. The words and pictures turned blurry and he had to fetch the gentleman's monocle that he hadn't worn ever since it had gone out of fashion over a hundred years ago. Ha ha, you look ridiculous, said Bethany when she spotted him squinting through it. I thought you were trying to be good, said Ebenezer. I am. Aren't good people supposed to be honest? I'm telling the truth that that thing makes you look ridiculous. You might be right, he said as he caught sight of his reflection, but I won't be wearing it for long. My eyes will be strong again once I have the potion. Ebenezer went into the kitchen and made Bethany a large dinner, one that would fatten her up nicely for the beast. He fried a slab of red meat in one pan and boiled a small bucket of potatoes in the other. Dinner time, he shouted once it was ready. Bethany stomped to the kitchen table carrying a goblin comic under one arm. She f held the comic open with one hand and forked potatoes into her mouth with the other. That looks interesting, said Ebenezer. The front cover of the comic was a picture of a bright green goblin with orange boots and pointed yellow teeth. You can't have it, said Bethany. It's mine. I know it is. I bought it for you and I don't want it now anyway. I'll just borrow it after you're done with it. No. No? Yes. No. What do you mean, no? I mean, no. But I bought them for you. Yes, and I said thank you, which was very unlike me, and now all the ones in the sack are mine. You didn't actually say the words thank and you, and do you mean that you're not going to let me read any of them? That's right, I don't like sharing. Well, in that case, you're not allowed to read whilst you're eating dinner. Bethany shrugged and closed her comic. She started forking potatoes into her mouth at a rapid pace. If I lend you one of my comics, will you get me a pet? She asked between forkfuls. Bethany, I will never ever get you a pet. Stop asking me about it. But why? Don't you know? Don't you want to know what it's like to have one? I already know what it's like, he answered, looking a little uncomfortable. A few centuries ago, I had a charming Cheshire cat called Lord Tibbles. Unfortunately, things did not end well. What happened? she asked, leaning forward with interest. Was he a scratchy cat? The scratchy ones are my favourite. No, no, no. Lord Tibbles was a perfect gentleman. He was kind and he was fluffy right up until the day the beast decided to eat him. Bethany's mouth curled into an expression of appalled horror, but Ebenezer wasn't finished yet. He thought it might be a novel sensation to tell her the whole truth about his relationship with the beast. Besides, it wasn't like she was going to be alive long enough to do anything about it. So you know when I said that the beast conjures treats for people who are good? Well, that was a rotten lie, he said. I bring the beast food to eat and it rewards me with magical potions and other rewards. Bethany's fork fell from her hand and it clattered onto the floor. She didn't seem to notice. The beast was jealous of Lord Tibbles, explained Ebenezer. One day it said it wasn't going to give me any more potions unless I handed over the cat. And what did you say? asked Bethany, spitting out crumbs of potato as she did so. I said goodbye, Lord Tibbles, and then I chucked it into the beast's mouth, he answered. I loved that cat, but I loved me more. I wasn't going to let old age kill me just to save some animal. Bethany had lost some of her appetite. Thoughts of the beast eating Lord Tibbles made her push the plate away. I think I was wrong, she said. About the pet idea, he asked. No, about you. I don't think you are a goody two-shoes after all. Ha! See? Told you so. Ebenezer wasn't feeling in such a ha sort of mood when he saw the look on Bethany's face. She was looking at him in the way that most people looked when they saw the beast. There was fear in her eyes. Ebenezer didn't like this. He was used to people being afraid of the beast, but he wasn't used to people being afraid of him. You know what? Actually, I think you're right. I suppose I am a bit of a goody two-shoes, he said hopefully. No, you're not. A goody two-shoes would never have fed Lord Tibbles to the beast. You're a, uh, well, I don't even know what type of shoes you are, she said. Have you fed many cats to the beast? 
The beast doesn't like to eat the same thing more than once, explained Ebenezer, and it doesn't find the taste of cat very that interesting. What else have you fed it, she asked. Ebenezer thought about all the things that he had brought the beast to eat. Every antique and every animal, all the exotic creatures and all the ancient artefacts. Bethany was still looking at him in a funny, somewhat uncomfortable way, so he decided not to tell her anything too gruesome. Oh, just a few things here and there, he answered, nothing that horrid. Is there anything the beast can't eat, she asked. It said it was allergic to trumpets a couple of days ago, but that might have been a joke, he answered. Ha, I'm going to feed it one and find out, said Bethany. Hopefully it'll explode. If it does, then it will serve it right for what it did to me. You will do no such thing. Without the beast, I'll die. I don't care how much smoke he vomited at you, said Ebenezer. Bethany stopped speaking because she was still hurt by the memory of what had happened in the attic. Sorry, I didn't mean that. And look, I don't... I know you don't want to talk about it, but I just want to say one final time that I really am sorry about what happened, said Ebenezer, and I know you must miss your parents terribly. I don't, actually, said Bethany. There's no need to try and pretend that you don't. It's OK if you... I don't miss them, because I don't remember them, snapped Bethany. I was so young when it happened, I don't remember the fire or anything about my life before the orphanage. That's kind of why I wanted the bees to bring them back. I want to know what they were like. Oh, right, said Ebenezer. Right, I see. I completely understand. Ebenezer couldn't imagine what it would be like to have never known one's own parents. His own childhood had been perfectly splendid. More importantly, he couldn't think of any words he could say to make Bethany feel better. Bethany removed the crumpled photograph from her pocket, the one that on the beach with the moustached baby-carrying man and the moustacheless newspaper-holding lady. Bethany flattened it out and showed it to Ebenezer. This is the only picture that's left of us. I'm the scowling baby in my dad's arms. He looks a bit like you, said Ebenezer, as he peered at the picture again. There's the same glint of mischief in his eyes. Your mother looks a bit more sensible. Anyone who reads newspapers is likely to be well behaved. Look closer, said Bethany. Ebenezer held his monocle over the picture and peered more closely at the woman in the picture. He spotted that there was a very silly looking comic peeping out between the pages of the newspaper. Perhaps she wasn't so sensible after all. Every night before bed I look at the photo and imagine what they were like. Sometimes I make up stories about them. My mother the spy or my dad the astronaut or sometimes I imagine them as a pair of adventurers who are still trying to make their way back from a dangerous mission to the North Pole, said Bethany. She smiled sadly. She would trade all the stories in her head for a chance to meet them, even if they turned out to be the dullest people she ever met. Ebenezer sat in silence, thinking for a moment or two and searching his brain for some magical combination of words which might make Bethany feel less horrid about the fact that both her parents were strangers to her. Eventually, he said, you can keep all your comics, no need to lend me any, and you can read them at the dinner table if you like. It wasn't perfect and it probably wasn't going to help Bethany feel any better about the fact that her parents were dead, but she seemed happy enough. She grinned and returned to reading about goblins. Ebenezer, meanwhile, was feeling a little tired. Now that his body was ageing, he was feeling more worn out by the day's activities. He bid good night to Bethany and began the slow climb up the stairs. Wait, shouted Bethany before he even made it to the first floor. She ran up to him and sighed. <sighs> there are three whoopee cushions under your pillow, as well as a toad. You might want to move them before you lie down. Bethany then stamped her foot and ran back down the stairs, thoroughly annoyed. It was no fun being well behaved.